So on a surprisingly warm day back in October of 1984, I was born in a small hospital on Long Island in New York. Now, guys, I'm just joking. I'm not going to take it back that far. But I did want to record an episode for you where I share everything that's happened, all the big things at least, some milestones and some things that came up along the way throughout my dropshipping journey. And what I want to do specifically is share how at just 21 years old, right out of school, I was able to build a seven-figure dropshipping business because I do think that this is something that can resonate with others. It's one thing to watch the normal type of tutorials that I put up here, but I think it's another to really get to know someone's journey. Maybe there are things that will resonate with you. Maybe there are things that you've also experienced. Maybe there are things that'll just give you an extra piece of confidence or peace of mind like, yes, this is possible. And here's an actual story of somebody who has done this and not just done it, but at this point been doing it for over 15 years. So today we don't have any screen chairs. We don't have any whiteboards in the background. This is just a straight up me talking to you episode, sharing my journey of drop shipping. And again, hopefully this gives you at the very least some motivation and gives you an actual story from somebody who has been in this business. So I'm not going to take you back to when I was born in 1984. But I will take you back to when I graduated from SUNY Albany, upstate New York, in 2006. Now, when I graduated, I did not want to get a job. I always knew I wanted a business. I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. My parents, my dad was a butcher. My mom did inside sales. But I had an uncle who was an entrepreneur, saw that he had great results in his life through his business. He told me at a young age, it's not because I'm smarter than anybody. It's because I took a chance on myself. So I knew I wanted to take a chance on myself. But going back to 2006, I did not know anything about e-commerce. So my plan back then was to actually start physical businesses, brick and mortar businesses. The only problem, I only had about $25,000 that I had saved up throughout high school and college, working construction jobs, doing landscaping, selling Christmas trees, basically anything I could do that paid cash and paid more than minimum wage. So what I did straight out of school is try to find a business that I could buy to kind of just get something going. And my plan was to grow businesses, flip them, get into something bigger, grow that, flip it, get into something bigger, and so on and so on. So I had some things I was thinking of, like franchises. I went to some franchise trade shows. Comment if you've been to some of them yourself. But I almost opened a pita pit, if you're familiar with those, back in 2006 on Long Island by Hofstra, which was a huge college near where I grew up. Very happy I didn't sign that SBA loan, but that was one of my options. Instead, the thing that I actually did do was go online and find the cheapest business I could find for sale. This is a terrible move. This is not business advice. Please don't do this. But I ended up spending that $25,000 I had saved. And actually, it was a little less than that. I had to borrow a few thousand from my parents. And I bought a delivery route. Again, this was the cheapest business I could find. And what this came with was a old van. Like think of the, one of those Ford white vans. And it came with the rights to drive into this bakery in Brooklyn, in the Hasidic area of Brooklyn, to load that thing up with huge boxes of cookies from this historic bakery, and then to sell them within Nassau County which if you know Long Island, that is the middle of Long Island, right? That's where I lived. That's where I knew. That's where I bought the rights to. Now, you're probably thinking, what does this have to do with dropshipping? Don't worry, we'll get there very soon. But what I had the ability in the beginning to do was sell these cookies wholesale to stores that this bakery already had contracts with. So I would drive on the BQE. I would load this truck up with cookies. I would drive to these grocery stores. I would pull up in the back. I would meet managers who hated their jobs. I would say, I'm here from, I'm not going to say the bakery's name, even though everything is fine with them. They're great. I'd say, I'm here from there. They'd say, okay, you know, go to your section. If you ever saw those guys in grocery stores with those big, uh, I think they're called U-boats. I don't remember. It's been so long, but I was one of those guys. I was pushing it out. I was unloading them. I was taking them out of the packages. We would invoice the stores, get paid, so on and so on. And then my goal was to pick up more stops, right? So I did this probably for only a few weeks before I realized what a bad investment I had made. Literally, my life savings at that point was invested into this. I had borrowed money from my parents. That truck or van, whatever you want to call it, that came with the delivery route started leaking gasoline if I filled it up above half a tank because it was so old and just beat up that I was just like, what am I doing? I was completely embarrassed. I was just you know, angry at myself for making this decision because it was completely my decision. And what I would do to try to get some money back in my bank account, because guess what? Selling cookies wholesale does not 
not pay well. I would make about $3 per huge box. And I forgot how many actual you know, packages were in there, but maybe 20 or so. So it was barely, it was peanuts. I was selling money, I was selling cookies and making peanuts. But um, what I was doing to just, again, try to replenish my bank account was continuing to work landscaping jobs on the days that I wasn't delivering and on uh, you know days that I had extra time, finish early with the route, go work on the truck for the guy I'd been working with since I was in high school. So I was doing that. And luckily within this very, very short time span, again, this is going back a long time now. So don't know the specifics. Most likely it was within maybe a couple months one of the guys that I was working with said, you know, he knew I was into entrepreneurship. He said, did you hear about this new book? And what, what book are you talking about? And he said, the four hour work week, have a copy of, cop, copy of it right here. Um, and I said, no, I have no idea what that is. It sounds like a scam. And he's like, no, it's awesome. I just read it. I'll let you borrow it. So I was like, okay, cool. So next day we showed up to drive the truck and mow people's lawns and lift heavy barrels full of leaves and not going to complain. I got a good tan and I was pretty jacked back then. But uh, he gave me a copy of the book. I went home. I started reading it. And I was like, you know what? A lot of this book resonates with me. It's completely different than what I have you know, in mind for myself. It had, I think I haven't read it. It's been over 10 years. But it had a chapter about building an online store and how you could do it yourself. And it had a chapter or so about Google ads and how you can basically advertise online, right? Run little search ads. So I, th this, it stuck with me, right? And I was thinking like, this sounds awesome, but um, in the book, the example that Tim Ferriss, the author gives is, a, uh, I think it's a nootropic, like a, a supplement that he sold. And I was like, well, can I even have anything like that made? I don't, I have no idea how that works. I don't have any money right now, so I can't go formulate something. And then I was thinking, well, what could I try to apply principles from this book with? And maybe you can guess it. The one thing I had access to at that time were cookies from that bakery in Brooklyn. So I thought, you know what, let me, let me give this a try. I was, you know, I was really regretting again and just down on myself about this investment I made in this delivery route. And I was very excited about what I had just read in this book. So I took my old Dell Inspiron laptop and I went to the library one weekend. You asked me why I went to the library, I couldn't even tell you, maybe because I just wanted some focused space, kind of how I did similar in uh, college when I would just you know sit in one of those little, not cubicles, but those little booths they have and just block everything out, I wanted that. So I brought my laptop, plugged it in, went to Yahoo Stores, which was the e-commerce platform that, uh, that was recommended in this book and was really one of the only few platforms around back then, and I built a website. And the website was selling New York cookies. So at the first time I went to the library, I signed up. It was $29 for a month. I bought my domain name. You know, I entered, it was the ugliest looking website you'll ever see in your life. But back then, most websites were. Um, it had some simple text. And the way I tried to, to market it, right, my angle was if you moved out of New York and you miss these fresh New York bakery products, we have them for you from this historic bakery, right? That was the, that was the, the unique value proposition. That's who I envisioned buying from it. Now, I realized I didn't have any photos of these cookies to put on the website, so I went out to Best Buy probably. That's, I think, like where I'd buy all my electronics back then, but you know, whatever I could afford for a digital camera, and if you remember back then, in 2006, they were probably 1.3 megapixel, opened up some boxes of cookies, took some of the worst looking photos you would ever see, went back to the library the next day, uploaded them onto the website, and signed up for my first Google Ads account. Now, again, back then, Google ads were only search text, so no images, no Google shopping, none of that, just people search for something, you choose the keywords, and you have text appear. So I set up ads that were targeting people that were outside of New York, but in the United States, that were searching for things like NYC cookies, or New York cookies, or black and white cookies, or rainbow cookies. And then the text in my ad said something like, again, can't remember, this is so long ago, but something like, you know, if you miss fresh baked New York bakery cookies, click here, you know, shipping within two days, something like that. And I was completely shocked because within a few days of this, you know, library experiment working on this old Dell laptop and pictures with this low quality camera and my first ever attempt at ads, this little website was making more money for me than the delivery route. 
So I was like, okay, this, this works. There's something going on here. So I decided, you know what? I'm not going to continue with like the landscaping to build up extra cash because now I actually have another form of income. And it was my first ever form of online income. And obviously at that point, I'm not gonna quit the delivery route because that was my in, that was my access to the products. And I just kind of kept this running and I thought, let's see what this can turn into, right? Maybe this can be the thing that I've always wanted. Maybe this can be the thing that really blasts me into my, entrepreneurial journey so I could have the multiple houses, the multiple cars, the multiple boats, like my uncle that I was talking about earlier. Now, what happened was kind of leading that direction, but it didn't get me where I wanted to be. I can't remember the exact month that I started this, this, this first website, but what I do remember is that when we went into the holiday season, so kind of like right after, um, you know, right after Halloween, as we went into Thanksgiving and then especially into Christmas, the website started to get a lot more traffic, which is a good thing. And it started to get a lot more sales, which is also a good thing, but it meant I was working a lot because at this point in the beginning, the bakery was not drop shipping these for me. I was just buying them wholesale. Then I would bring them to my house. I literally had folding tables set up like kind of an assembly line where they would be repackaged into other boxes. I'd put a little card in there. We would have USPS pick them up every day and ship them out. And it got to the point where it was so busy going into the holidays that I literally had to have my family and my friends come over and help me box up all these holiday orders. We had hospitals buying them for all their employees. We had customers buying them for holiday parties, and it was just a ton of volume. Again, not a bad thing, but I was looking at it and I was like, okay, I am, you know, I, I basically, I felt stressed out about it, not complaining, still grateful for that opportunity. But I was thinking I'm doing all this work. I'm having my family and friends help because if I don't, we're not going to get orders out the door. And I just thought one day like, well, what can I do to, you know, build a website like I have now, right? A website that is generating a ton of income, getting lots of traffic, lots of sales. What can I do that can use Google ads, but where I don't need to have all these things going out the door to actually make a good income. And the first thing that stood out to me or just popped into my head was, why don't you just sell more expensive items? At that time, I was selling these products for about $10 average order value for a box of cookies, making you know three or $4 per order that went out the door. And I thought, well, what if I sold an item that was $1,000 and I made three or $400? Why can't I do that? So I started to think, well, let's let's figure this out, right? Is this actually possible? So at this point, still had the delivery route, still had the website, but started to spend my free time doing what I would now call high ticket drop shipping research. Even then, I, I kind of put drop shipping in there a little too early. Trust me again, we're getting to the drop shipping, but I just started to do high ticket product research. Now, I don't use this method anymore, but again, I wanted to share my journey and things that you know, kind of happened along the way. And what happened back then is I would go to eBay and in eBay, you can obviously click into the different categories. And then in the sidebar, this is still there, but there's an, um, an option where you can look at only completed uh, listings. So I would go into different categories where the items I knew were expensive, and then I would click completed listings and I would look for products that sold consistently. So multiple sales every day at these high prices. So I found a ton of options, but eventually I just picked one and I thought, okay, I want to sell this category of products. So from there I needed the products, right? I didn't have, you know, another bakery in a high ticket niche. So what I did was go to alibaba.com and I looked for those products in China. Still never been to China. Again, going on over 15 years in e-commerce, never been to China, but I went to alibaba.com, looked for these products, found a bunch of suppliers, contacted them all, got price lists, and I almost thought like this seems too easy, right? Because all these suppliers are showing me, you know, pictures of their their warehouses. I was even doing Skype calls with them. They were sending me photos, and I was like, "Okay, I I, I want to do this." I think I narrowed it down to maybe 5 products or so because I knew I couldn't just bring in tons of them, didn't have the capital available to put it out there. So, what I did decided to do, instead of just sending China a bunch of money and you know waiting a month or so for the products to arrive, is I went back to that library with that same laptop and I built another Yahoo store. Now, I'm not going to say what that one was, but I built it around a certain niche. 
and I uploaded products and photos from this one that I picked, one supplier in China that we just seemed to have the best communication together. I uploaded their products. I put on all the product pages, these uh, products are made to order. And I think the shipping times were like four to six weeks. I put something like that. And then I set up Google ads. And within a few days, I got a sale for over $500. And I was blown away because I was like, okay, this does work. The same thing that I did for low ticket cookies works for high ticket, these much more expensive products. And then the next day I got another sale and another sale and another sale. And in a very short amount of time, this new store that again, I didn't even have the products for did over $30,000 in sales. But this is where things got scary. And I took on a ton of risk. Again, remind you, I was 21 years old at the time. So I had a much, I was much more, you know, willing to take on this risk. And this is not what I do now, but just want to get you to where we are now. But what I did once we had all these orders come through and I knew based on conversations with my suppliers that I had enough products to fill up a 20 foot container is I place an order with this supplier. I didn't speak into an Alibaba. I had to send them, um, uh, 30% of the money to basically build these products that my customers already ordered, mind you. I already had the money. So I paid the supplier, I believe 30%. They made the products a week later. They were in a 20 foot container. They sent me all this paperwork showing that it was on the ocean. And uh, that I was, first of all, I was thinking, I hope this container is not empty. I hope it's not filled with bricks. You know, I hope these products, one, are actually there. And two, I hope the quality is what I, you know, am believing them to be. Um, because again, I was putting, you know, customers money out there back then. So I waited a few weeks. Again, I had all this paperwork. I had to find, uh, this is this was all new to me back then for this first order. But I had to find a port where this thing could arrive and a warehouse it can go to. So back at that time, I was living in New York. I had it shipped to a, uh, basically a warehouse like near the, the port in New Jersey. And they told me what day it would arrive. And I'm probably the only person to do this. Like all the people that worked in this, it's not even a warehouse, like picture in a, you know, in a movie when you see like all those cargo ships coming in and, you know, all those huge cranes and stuff. I, I literally drove my car maybe an hour and a half, two hours from New York to this place in New Jersey uh, by myself, got there and had them open up this container for me. I pulled out all of the boxes. I opened them up. I made sure that the right products were in them. And then I literally was putting uh, um, shipping labels on them there. And then I had them picked up from there. Again, I don't think anybody has ever done that because they were looking at me like I was crazy. And I was, but I was also very happy because I knew that now my products could ship to my customers. And I knew the quality was, again, you know, with uh, in line with what I was expecting. So that was how I got started with high ticket e-commerce. Now, once I knew this was you know, legit, I started to run a lot more traffic, started to do more and more sales, and started to actually pre-order products because I knew what was selling. So by the time it came in, we were ready to have it, instead of you know go to a port with me showing up, uh, have it go to a fulfillment center where they could put on labels for it and get it right out the door. But what happened after, again, we're going back a while now, but maybe you know call it a year or so of using this met model, I started to have companies actually contact me through my online store. And what they would say is something similar to this. They'd say, hey, we see you're selling products XYZ. We also manufacture products XYZ. If you want to sell them on your store, you can list them. Here's all of the product information. When you sell them, we will ship them to your customers from our warehouse and wherever their warehouse is. And they would send me the price lists with what the wholesale price was, so my cost, and what the um, price I should sell them for was. And at first I was like, this sounds like crazy. Like this sounds, again, like almost too good to be true. Like why would you you want me to sell your stuff, but I decided let's give it a try. I guess now instead of having the five or 10 products I had available at that point, I basically got up to 50 products and you know what happened? I started getting more traffic and I started getting more sales. And although the profit margins were not as high as the products that I was importing directly from China. And at this point I brought in, you know, a dozen plus containers. I realized I could sell these all, ship them out right away, offer many more products, get much more traffic. And it equaled a, a higher net profit profit number because there were more sales, again, hands off sales. So that was my basically introduction to drop shipping. I didn't even know what drop shipping was. And I'm just looking down because I made like a list here of things I wanted to make sure that I, I don't forget to, to mention. But yeah, that was basically my introduction to drop shipping. These companies contacted uh, me. So from there, basically what happened is I started to not just, you know, only work with companies that were contacting me selling, can you sell our stuff? 
But I started to reach out to other companies and say, can we sell your stuff? Basically finding other manufacturers. And this did work. A lot of them said, yes, we had you know maybe hundreds or thousands of products at that time. But what I realized is as we grew kind of broader, the conversion rate, meaning the amount of visitors that turned into customers started drop ship, uh, started not drop shipping, started dropping. And what I eventually realized was the cause was because I started to build almost a general store, right? We weren't, we weren't selling everything and anything, but we weren't just selling in one niche anymore. We were mixing a bunch of stuff together. So I just had the simple idea of do what I know how to do, which as I hope you realize now, it's not coding. It's not being some math wizard who's amazing with ads. It's being someone who executes and actually does things. So I went back to the library, brought that laptop, and I built more and more stores, not with new products, but breaking up all the different product types I had. And instead of having them on one store, I built multiple niche-specific stores. As soon as I did this, got all the work done, set up all the new ads, the conversion rates went way back up and the business was more profitable than ever. So that was kind of my first experience with having a general store versus niche specific, which as you know, if you've watched my videos over the past 10 years or so, niche specific definitely does work best when it comes uh, to becoming an authority in the niche and getting high conversions. But from there, I, I'm gonna fast forward a bit because I've done, I did that, I should say, for maybe four or five years. Again, this whole process of building more and more stores, getting more and more suppliers. And um, you know, it was working as you could imagine. It was growing, growing profitably, everything was great. And then I eventually decided, you know what, let me sell a store. So I did go ahead and basically have a listing through a website broker for not just one store, but it was a network of closely related stores and it sold relatively fast and I got more money in one deposit than I had ever seen in my life. And I was just extremely happy, right? So that was my learning experience that these businesses aren't just profitable, these online businesses, but they are also assets that there are many, many people out there looking to purchase to basically buy cash flow. So if you're wondering and you want to like look for stores for sale, my advice honestly is don't buy one, just build one and then maybe sell it one day. Um, you could check out empireflippers.com. I'm, I'm friends with uh, the two owners of that company, but they do an amazing job. They've sold tons of stores for Dropship Lifestyle students and uh, they sell for really good multiples. So check them out. Um, let's see. Again, I want to make sure I keep this sequential because there really is just so much that has happened over time. But um, yeah, I would say the next lesson that I learned, right? So sold this network of stores, again, still had many other ones. And at that point, it was crazy because I was still at a, a point in my life where I didn't want to outsource anything. I thought, you know, this is such a, a golden opportunity, basically. This is such an amazing business that I don't want anybody else to almost put their hands on it and mess it up because then I will be upset about it, right? Like I'll, I don't want to... I don't want to kill my babies, the things that are working so well. But it got to a point where the businesses got so big that I did eventually kind of have to outsource customer service. Um, I've done videos on this in the past, but I'll just say now, the lesson that I learned there was I should have done it literally years and years earlier. As soon as you have a business, if you're looking for like a takeaway and you're currently running a drop shipping store, as soon as you have a business that is profitable enough to afford somebody that can handle your emails, order processing, inbound phone calls, live chat, social, uh, social messages if you get them, do it. Because not just will it make your business better and make your customers happier, because you could have somebody that, that there's their only job, it also will open up your time immensely so that you can focus not on these you know everyday repetitive tasks, but on things that can continue to grow your business. So that was a massive lesson learned for me. And then the next lesson that I did want to share with you was something that I did struggle with for a while, again, at this phase where like things are going so well and I'm picking up more and more suppliers, I'm building more and more stores. I, I had the, I always had the thought like, why, why are all these companies just letting us sell their stuff? Like, is it like, I don't wanna say a glitch, but is this like a short-term thing that they're gonna realize, you know, why are we giving Anton's company and Anton's competitors companies all this money for selling our stuff when we can just do it ourselves? Like I had that fear, especially as this really became not just my livelihood, but something bigger than I ever could have imagined it. So one day, again, we're going way back here, but I had one of our top suppliers, the owner of it, call me and he said, Anton, you know, I know you're in New York. I'm going to be in New York for a meeting. Do you want to meet up and get a coffee? And I was like, yeah, definitely. And when we had that meeting, he shared so much with me that just helped on my journey. Um, I've actually done a whole separate uh, episode just on that. I'll link it below if you want to check that out. But also the, the thing I want to share here is I asked him that question. I said, you know, 
we obviously do a ton of uh, sales for you, which is great. Love the relationship. But I'm just curious, like, why don't you sell direct to the public? Why do you allow us to basically bring you all these sales? And he said to me, Anton, our business is not B2C. We are not retailers. Our business, speaking from him, from his company, is basically doing research within their industry, finding the best quality manufacturers, making the best possible products at the best price point, and that is the business. And I realized it really clicked with me because before that, I just thought of it like you have a business in this niche. But what I realized during our conversation was that it's two different businesses, right? Like even when I was bringing in products myself from China, these products were not custom made things that I did research for and designed. These were basically, you know, white label products, if you want to call it that, that anybody could buy and put their name on it, where his business was actually designing products. And that is not the same as building online stores. That is not the same as getting traffic. That is not the same as dealing with customers and customer expectations. It is a completely different business. And that really did give me a lot of um, a lot of confidence moving forward that this was not some short-term thing, but that, oh, okay, if I do continue to work with the right type of brands, the ones that are not just white labeling or private labeling products, but the ones that are focused on making excellent products for their industry and working with retailers like us to bring them the sales, then this is not going anywhere. Again, that was a huge pivotal moment for me because it just gave me much more confidence to not just continue, but to go even harder, to put more money into ads, to get better at marketing to get better at everything in e-commerce. So I did want to share that with you um, now. Now, one more thing that I did want to share because, you know, I've done, again, just so you know, the Dropship Lifestyle YouTube channel has been around for, I believe, like eight or nine years. Dropship Lifestyle, this past summer, we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. So you've probably heard some of the things throughout this video before because I've been sharing a message for a while. But what I you know, just want to address now is, Anton, if you've done all this and you're doing all this, why are you talking to me right now? Why aren't you just you know, sitting on a beach or playing golf or why aren't you just you know, running your stores? So another kind of pivotal, pivotal moment in my e-commerce career was right around that time that I sold that first network of stores. Again, I you know had this huge deposit come in and I really had to make a decision of what do I want to do next? Do I want to just continue to grow more and more stores and just do that indefinitely? Or do I wanna just kind of have this handful of stores and make them the best they could be? Both are extremely profitable. Obviously, if you're willing to do the work, having all of them would be much more profitable. So I started to go out there and look at, you know, who were the companies, basically, who were my competitors that were trying to build, you know, not just a few stores, but literally hundreds of them. Um, back then, there was CSNstores.com, which is now Wayfair. They used to be CSN stores, and they literally had hundreds of niche sites. Same thing with Hayneedle.com. And I was, you know, researching these companies heavily, and I realized that they had these massive office spaces. They were still drop shipping. So not warehouses, but massive office spaces with literally, you know, 300, 400, 500 employees in there. And I just knew as soon as I started to realize like what they did to get to that size, that was not for me. Okay. Even though the money would be much better, Wayfair, for example, that was CSN stores, they became Wayfair. They now do multiple billions of dollars in sales a year. They're a publicly traded company, still almost completely drop shipping. I just knew that I didn't want to be going into an office every day where there was 400 employees. That was not my choice. So I decided I'm going to you know, keep the stores that I have. If I eventually want to build more, I could build more. But instead of becoming the next Wayfair or Hayneedle, what I'll do is actually just try to share some of this information that I have that I, at that point I had learned over the past, I don't know, seven or eight years or so. So I started to go online. If you remember the warriorforum.com, you're probably older like me. I'm 38 now. No, I'm 39. I think I'm 39. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, you know, it was like a forum for people that were in online business. Didn't know about it as I was growing, but found it when I wanted to share. And I basically just started to, to chime in and comment on posts about e-commerce. People saw that I was giving value and, you know, thanked me basically, and they wanted more information. So back then, again, just over 10 years ago, I uh, created the first version of Dropship Lifestyle. And I thought, again, I'm not going to build hundreds or thousands of stores. So let me keep what I have and let me basically give this opportunity to others, other people that want the lifestyle that's achievable through this high ticket dropshipping method. And let me just put it out there. So again, over 10 years ago, first version comes out, um, did amazing, and not just in terms of sales, but in terms of the quality of people that came in. We started doing live events back then, and we still do them, but um, I didn't even mention this. After, you know, around this time period, I decided, 
Again, thanks, Tim Ferriss, for our work week. Let me try to you know, do the uh, location arbitrage thing. So went out to Thailand, which was supposed to be a three-week trip, and then ended up staying for nine months in Chiang Mai, up in northern Thailand in the mountains. Uh, after that, I lived in uh, in Vietnam for almost four years. That's where I met my wife. So as I'm you know living out there, I'm creating m- more and more updated versions of Dropship Lifestyle, which has become our flagship program now, the Dropship Blueprints. I am making YouTube videos, as you've, again, probably seen. I'm posting on on our blog at dropshiplifestyle.com and literally building a community, tens of thousands of people strong from not just, you know, New York, where I grew up, where I would go to some, you know, entrepreneur meetups I found on meetup.com or not just on the warrior forum where a couple hundred people would see it, but now literally tens of thousands of people all around the world, meeting them at our live events, meeting them on Skype, meeting them on coaching calls. And um, that's when, you know, after I would say even the first year of Dropship Lifestyle, I knew that that was the thing that I will do forever. So of course, keep the stores that I have. When there's a time to sell, they will be sold. But also work with other people that want what I have basically from this work. Coach them every step of the way. Help them on their stores. Look at their ads. Look at their websites. Do everything I can to help other people live the dropship lifestyle. That's why I'm called dropship lifestyle. So. Um, Along that journey, again, continue to learn, continue to update the program. One cool thing, standout thing that happened along the way is we were voted best e-commerce course by Shopify. This is the only time they've given out this award, one year, and they chose Dropship Lifestyle because they can track everything and they see that our students get results. So I'm extremely proud of that. Um, You know, just thousands of success stories, people whose lives were changed because they didn't have to just sit there and think, well, what kind of business am I going to start? They didn't have to get themselves into some kind of debt to start a business because you could start this cheap. They simply followed a plan, became part of a community and got what they wanted out of life. And I am grateful for that. I'm grateful to be somebody that can help them do that. And I'm grateful to still not just be involved with e-commerce, but be obsessed with it and literally try to learn something new every single day. So that was kind of my journey as of, uh, as of right now. I'm just going to see if there's anything else that I did want to mention, but um, not really. I think that covers the the basics. Again, I've shared more details on some of the stories intertwined with this episode um, you know, in the past years, so I'll link some of those up in the description. But what I would love to know from you as part of the Dropship Lifestyle community is what is your story? How did you get started with dropshipping? You know, there's always different paths that lead us to this. Now you know mine. I would love to know yours. Be sure to leave a comment below if you're watching this on YouTube. And if you're listening to this as a podcast on Spotify, I'm going to post that as a question below this episode. Please take a minute and type your answer in there because I would love to hear from you. All right, guys, hope you found that useful. I hope you found that helpful or at the very least, uh, now you know more about me. And uh, yeah, with that being said, thank you all. I appreciate you. And I look forward to talking to you not just next week, but again and again for decades to come here at Dropship Lifestyle. All right. Thank you, everybody.